Grazie a Bosco. Uh, he has double appointment at uh, Yale University and um, uh, University of Bayocca. In uh, <laughs> Bicocca. Bayocca. 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 <laughs> Hello, uh, good evening everybody. We are uh, honored to have here Professor Mario Strizzabot. Uh, <laughs> Three. <laughs> good evening everybody. We are honored to have in Seattle uh, Professor Mario Strizzabosco. He has a double appointment at the uh, University of Milan, uh, Maiocca. And uh, 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 I've done another one. Yale and uh, Bicocca University in Milan. Um, he has uh, written uh, more than 100 papers uh, uh, in PubMed, does research on um, liver uh, chronic disease and uh, uh, liver cancer. He um, uh, leads two uh, laboratories, one in the uh, US and one in Milan. Uh, so 60% of his activity happens in, um, in Italy, while the rest is here in the US. Uh, he represents an amazing example uh, to us that, uh, we, that we do most of our activity here in, um, in the US. And I think when we initially moved um, uh, here, we all had the dream to bring back what we had learned. But it's not easy at all. Uh, and so we hope today we learn the secret uh, from Professor Strasabosco. Thank you. Tavolo con la carbonara, va bene? <ride> Ma sono costretto a parlare da qua in inglese e a fare un discorso che non riguarda voi che siete già più avanti, bensì eh, i giovani che lo vedranno su, su, sul website di Snap. Quindi scusatemi se alcune cose sembreranno patetiche ma eh, sono rivolte a, a Young Isnef fondamentalmente, va bene? Introduction, and uh, thanks to both of you for flying me here uh, from my uh, place in Connecticut. Um, I'm very honored to give this Isnef lecture, and very honored because Isnef is now a great uh, reality. Uh, is, um, is a very, it plays a very important role in facilitating the interactions between US-based scientists and Italy-based scientists. And uh, as soon as I joined this organization, I found it amazing the fact that uh, you were able to interact not only with biomedical scientists, which we always do, but also with scientists from physicists, physics, uh, <laughs> engineering, humanities, uh, art, and, and, and it, and you can really work together with these people because uh, the projects from ISNAP are never really focused on one discipline. Uh, ISNAP wants to promote uh, bicultural exchanges between uh, North America and Italy on the, on the whole spectrum of, uh, of science. Having said that, um, when I received the invitation and I thought, how should I organize this? Uh, mentorship lecture. I actually don't even really know what it is, a mentorship lecture. <laughs> so I thought it was basically uh, telling you what, what my experience was, uh, my experience in working between Italy and between the U.S., and um, uh, uh, find some, uh, some talking points that maybe of help uh, for whoever wants to uh, try this experience, or, or whether he's working here or he's planning to go back or, plan or planning to stay and then uh, I'll be able to take questions. So my, my career uh, has always developed on a dual uh, part because I am a researcher, but I also am a physician. I work in Italy, but I also work in the US. So this being both in an almost quadrangular way has always defined the thing that I was doing and uh, together with a little bit of restlessness, <laughs> it became what it is. So, um, why did I decide to become a researcher? Uh, first came the fact that I felt uh, 
a drive to become a researcher before becoming a, a scientist. And, and I don't know the reason. The reason is simply uh, curiosity. I always wanted to understand how things were working, how things were made, and, and, and look into things, uh, reading about the stars, the dinosaurs, the, the uh, exploration. I, I was born in 56, so by that time we had uh, space, uh, sp the space race, uh, and, uh, and we were always looking at the U.S. as the place where things were happening. Okay? We were watching the U.S., we were watching what was going on there, we had great example, great leadership. So I, I basically felt a U.S. citizen, even if when I was a little kid uh, and, and, I, and I was studying at the high school and thinking what I was going to do. And then next, why did I decide to become a physician? <coughs> well, it has to be somehow to, it has to deal with, with, with the need to do something for other people. It seems um, um, obvious, but not always it is. And you have to have this uh, willingness to be helpful to somebody <laughs> and, and, and to put the two things together. So, When I, when I first enrolled in the medical school at the University of Padova, um, I immediately grew very bored with the lessons there. Okay? There were a lot of frontal lessons and I, I didn't think they were any worth. And I needed to see the real thing. So I became uh, attending as an internal student, what was called the Institute of General Pathology in, in, uh, in the University of Padua. That was a great institute. Uh, Giovanni Felice Zone, Aloisi, uh, Pozzan, uh, great many, uh, great scientists. Some of them, even if based in Italy, they became member of the U.S. Uh, Academy of Sciences. So I used to go there as a student uh, and uh, my, uh, I was very proud that I was able to generate mitochondria out of a piece of a liver, right? To peel off the mitochondria and, and these big scientists were then studying the mitochondria, even if it's just working as a, as a technician. That, that was a, a, a great joy for me and I participated to the discussion about how the cell got the energy and the biophysics and everything. But then the other side of me kicked in and said, well, what this is all about? And I decided that I should start becoming an internal student also in the first medical clinic. So I started to uh, attend the clinic as a student and um, and all of a sudden, I got excited with, with, the, with the adrenaline, right? With the fast pace of clinical activities as compared to the slow pace of research activities. So you can get very excited with research, but your basic <laughs> attitude is something we're trying to make it working. Whereas in the clinic, you can see results. They can be bad, they can be good but you have uh, a totally different uh, level of excitement. And then these two parts came together and finally I decided that I was going to be uh, probably a physician scientist. And how did I become a hepatologist? Well, that has to do that when I was attending the, the first medical clinic in Padova, um, uh, having the background of the General Pathology Institute, I was not impressed by the people who attended the clinic in terms of uh, professor, but one person actually really struck me as a, as a real scientist among them. And so I joined his group and he was an pathologist. Just by accident I became an pathologist, but it could have been uh, different <laughs> as something else. So <clears throat> got my degree and uh, and then I did my specialty in internal medicine. And after I did my specialty in internal medicine, I decided that I wanted to get a PhD, right? So I asked, I said, I would like to enroll in a PhD. And at that time, the PhD that was most closely related to, to liver diseases was in Modena. It was a combined PhD. And I applied, and <laughs> they said no. And I lost my application. I said, why is that? I have already published a few papers. But you know, there are a few places and these are reserved for 
um, people coming from another school. So my mentor was a very great scientist, but <laughs> not a very politically influenced uh, person. And this is when I had my first contact with Italian University, right? The fact that I was denied the ability to enroll in a PhD program. And the person that enrolled into that program instead of me actually dropped off. But I also learned another lesson, okay, that every disappointment is a blessing. In fact, <coughs> if I did enroll in that PhD, I would have missed a number of real opportunities. So I enrolled in the gastroenterology specialty, and two years later I was able to enroll in a different uh, PhD program, but the law says that you can stop the specialty to do a PhD, but not vice versa. Okay? So I was able to do both the GI fellowship and the PhD, otherwise I would only have done the PhD. And I would never have become primario <laughs> of gastroenterology because I could never get the specialty. So see, there's, there's always uh, some meaning even in the fields. Okay? Um, also at that time, uh, in, a, in a meeting, um, a bioacid meeting, I, I first met uh, James Boyer from Yale University, and uh, <clears throat> I decided that he was doing the coolest thing on earth, that his methodological approach, the thing that he was doing with the single cells, living microscopy, were just cool things, <laughs> and I wanted to learn that. So I approached him, I asked him uh, whether I could come. He said, I'm totally pleased if you come and if you bring your money. <laughs> so I had like a couple of years of looking and searching and, uh, and finding the, the, the right fellowship to come and then at the end I got a fellowship from NATO, a fellowship from a private foundation and one from the NIH. So I was able to join his lab at the River Center at Yale University. <coughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and I was extremely lucky because um, to find the right mentor is clearly one of the most important things, okay? And Jim was, was very tough. His, labs was, his lab was attended by uh, people that already had a good experience. And I could not have survived uh, in that lab just coming straight from the Clinica Medica. I mean, my early years at the Institute of General Pathology were really key for me to succeed. Um, one was one of those laboratories in the U.S. where the, you know you are a little turtle and you can make it or not to the sea <laughs> or die <laughs> while trying. But if you if you if you really uh, were showing that you had uh, some talents, Jim would really look after you and, and become. And so that brings me to. <clears throat> two important topics, right? <laughs> so one uh, is, uh, if, you, if you go to the States, where should you go? Big lab, small lab, all right? Big lab is a very influent uh, uh, PI who, who can do a lot for you, but big lab is also very little mentorship, very little day-to-day -day mentorship, big competition, <coughs> high risk of failure, right? So my, my suggestion, to whoever is, is willing to consider this approach is to go first on a small lab with a very good mentor and day-to-day -day activity and then leave that lab, as bad as it may seem, to go on a bigger lab. Where you, and you can go there with all your baggage of experience and knowledge and be very competitive and use that lab to go then and look for a faculty position. So this should be the, the, uh, the pathway, in my opinion. The other thing is the relationship with, uh, with the mentor and the mentoring, okay? This is not a straightforward relationship. It's not anybody uh, deserve to be mentored just because it's there. It, 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 it has to be some sort of chemistry between you and your mentor. You have to, to show eagerness. You have to show that you, are, you deserve to be mentored. And he has to understand that he, he needs to invest in you because you can do it. So you have to work 
very carefully on this relationship. We have to work actually very intensely. Don't expect the mentor to be a mentor just because you are in your lab. It's a mentor because you are able to create a special relationship. And, and, and this happens because you recognize this, that person as a real role model. And in fact, with Jim, after I left his lab, uh, we became uh, friends. I mean, for me to be able to spend a couple of weeks with him in, in Maine is like going there with, with one of my best friends. Really, our relationship grew to a real friendship and, and esteem, but started from the fact that both were able to develop <laughs> this special relationship. And the other thing is, there's not one single mentor. Don't make this mistake. You need more mentors, multiple mentors. I, I learned a lot from a number of people, okay? I learned the law of science for the first mentor I had. I learned everything about how to run science by, by Jim, and I learned how to run a, a division by Professor Crepaldi, who was my director of internal medicine at the University of Padova, and so on and so forth. So you, you take these models, you study these models very well. You understand how they operate, and you understand the circumstances, and then you will acquire certain skills. So you have different mentors for different models, for different skills. So, I spent three years with Jim, <laughs> and uh, the lab was very competitive. So I decided that in order to attract his attention, I had to pick up a very high risk project. But on the other hand, I could not fail. So I blended the usual way, okay? You get the high risk project and the lower risk project so that you end up with something. This mixture is very important. It's absolutely very important because you come from the Italy, you come here, you can't fail. You have to get up with something. But if you only do what is expected, it may be not enough, then you have to pick up also a high risk project and work intensely on that. And um, I was lucky and, uh, and persistent and the high risk project uh, succeeded. We were able to publish it in the uh, uh, <coughs> Journal of Clinical Investigation. And uh, so the question always is, you know, whenever somebody gives a, a mentorship lecture, they always say, pick up a good project, a project that will become important, a project where nobody is there yet, <laughs> but will be absolutely high tech, there will be some uh, economic value, this project has to stay with you for the next 10 years, uh, so be very careful. Come on, nobody is so clever. <laughs> you know, every time I listen to these things, I say, how can I do that? <laughs> I'm already a professor if I can do this. So nobody is so clever. But the important part is to start from something and then really be very perceptive of where this something is leading, where this something is going. So that's the very important essence of picking up a project. And, and, and my project at the year with Jim was absolutely risky, but we did it and then probably I acquired a, a place in this right uh, in, uh, uh, ventricle. After three years, um, I decided that the U.S. was a great place, but I was missing my friends. I was missing my ski trips, I was missing the sea, I was missing the city of art, and I was missing uh, the food. <laughs> and I, I decided that I should come back to Italy, okay, which I did. Now that's uh, lesson number two, you never go back. So when you, when you try to think about whether you should go back to Italy, remember, you're not going back. You are different, they are different, you have been away, you have been living at a very much faster pace than your friends. So yes, you're there, but your friends don't understand you very well, and you're not so interested in them anymore. So there's no going back. 
but still Italy can be a great place to be and in fact I went back um, but you know on one side in the US you are sort of celebrated for your age because you're lucky you discover something you go back to Italy and uh, they say okay I mean you're here very well you can be a volunteer <laughs> <laughs> So I volunteered to be a volunteer, and <laughs> I started to gain some money by doing uh, the Guardia Medica, by substituting uh, physicians, uh, uh, family, family doctor. But yet I was lucky because Professor Crepaldi believed in the thing that I did. And he, and he said, okay, I'm gonna set up a lab for you. And you'll be the owner of that lab. So that's a key moment, okay? In Italy, you are not the owner of a lab. So I didn't have a position, but I had a lab. And, and then uh, what was a very, very important moment, I was able to have a Teleton grant. So Teleton is fantastic. It gives you enough money, and the money is managed by Teleton, not by the department. So the result was that I was one of the younger, no position, but my lab, my money, okay? So that gave me a great freedom and also great enemies. <laughs> um, I started to set a lab, set a group, uh, we started to publish it in good journals, and one day uh, Professor Crepaldi calls me and said, you know, from tomorrow you're going to work on the liver transplant program. I said, what? you got to be kidding. I know nothing about transplant, number one, and then with transplant you only do clinical work, you don't publish anything. He listened to me and said, okay, go. <laughs> and, and I started to, to work with this liver transplant and then again, uh, what I believed uh, was just a waste of time was actually a major turning point in my career. Um, because after a few years, uh, the transplant program grew and people started looking for me to, to work on transplant programs uh, in Italy and not, uh, not in Padova. Um, during that time, I uh, became a, a, what assistant uh, in the hospital because there was no viability of uh, assistant professor, you know. They were all given out uh, three years before me in a, I don't know the uh, English translation of sanatoria, <laughs> you know, <like> health operation. <laughs> to, to, uh, so, so there was no possibility to be enrolled and no other position was made for the next 10 years, okay? So I could not do that. Then I started uh, to apply for uh, associate professorship uh, and um, many, many times I was suggested to back off the, the concorso. Finally, one day, uh, 99, uh, Bruno Gridelli, who was uh, a pupil of uh, Starzo, the, the transplant uh, maverick, calls me up and says, well, why don't we move all to Bergamo? They need to set up a transplant program there and um, and um, I'm going to set the surgery part, but they need you as an hepatologist. And my first reaction was, no way, I want to do an academic career, Bergamo is just a hospital. Why should I do that? Well, I said, well, think about it. And, and this is another lesson, always be flexible. Uh, don't try to cross uh, mountains that you cannot climb. Walk around them. And, uh, I decided that I could be happy being a chief of uh, GI in, in a very nice hospital. And I was 42 years old, which is absolutely very early for Italian career. So I moved to Bergamo. And in Bergamo, we had an incredibly exciting time. I mean, uh, they were able uh, to hire a group of uh, division chief, all between 40 and 45 years old. Uh, and this was possible because the, the general director that was retiring, he said, I have nothing to lose and I want to hire good young people. 
And, and so it happened that the transplant program that, that we initiated became uh, the second transplant program in, in Italy and uh, for the pediatric transplant was the first transplant program in Europe. We had, you know, we were young, energetic, free hand and completely free to, to change the landscape. So we started to do this new operation, the so-called split liver. You know, we were going around it and I say, the liver is a pair organ, like the kidney. You can always make two livers out of one, and then, so we, we I think that uh, we made an impact. But I couldn't remain without my research. Hmm? And so, you know, transplant is a great opportunity to meet people that then uh, is very grateful to you. And uh, in a couple of years, I was able to uh, um, generate a, a cell biology lab in this hospital using private donation, particularly from the Radice group and, and, and from a, a Bergamo, uh, a bank in Bergamo. Bergamo has a great, great addition of, uh, of uh, social um, <coughs> concern and, uh, and, and donation. It's uh, not uh, usual in Italy, but I had um, real big money to do that, okay? So by the time I set this lab, I got a call from Jim Boyer, which I was always very attached. I said, hey, Mario, what are you doing? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I said, why don't you come back? Um, we have a need for our transplant program, and uh, the program was closed five years ago. We need to reshape it, and also we we feel that your research is going to be it's going to fit very nicely with with the direction of the liver center. So consider to come back. And um, so again, if I won the first uh, PhD position, I would not have become a gastroenterologist. If, if I didn't listen to Professor Crepaldi that sent me to what I was considering a punishment at that time <laughs> to the transplant program, I could not have done this. So after a, a discussion with, uh, with my wife, and uh, we decided it was good for the kids, it was good for us, and, uh, and we moved to the States. So, if you want to move to the States, want to stay here, it's better for you if you do it right after your PhD and fellowship. It, everything becomes much more complex when you're a senior. Okay? The expectations are higher, uh, there's less money for senior, probably rightly so, than for young people, and uh, you don't have the time to uh, build your networking. Okay? So coming back as a senior is tougher. It's uh, another probably another praise to this country that <laughs> favors younger people rather than senior. You can do it. You can be successful. But remember, if you are planning to stay here, do it when you're young. So <clears throat> one of the other beauty of America is that it comes in all sizes. It fits all sizes. Okay? In America, you, you, you really can do what you're able to do. And, and you, you can have many different stories of people that have worked here in many different capacity and in many different ways. So be very confident that U.S. will find a way. If you're good, if you're persistent, there will be to shape it around you. And uh, so there are people that come here to stay, people that come here only to, to study and then come back, and people that is crazy enough to, 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 to never decide whether they want to stay here or there, okay? But if you want to stay here, then you have to be aware of uh, certain differences between Europe and the uh, U.S. And the number one difference is that science is different. European science is more descriptive. European science uh, favors novelty over feasibility. European science uh, uh, needs less preliminary da data, but gives you less funding. And European sciences favor aggregation in groups rather than individualism. Okay? The opposite is true.
for U.S. and the NIH. So the NIH is more mechanistic. They're not descriptive. One of the major mistakes you can make in a paper, in a grant, is being descriptive. Uh, is risk adverse? NIH doesn't take risks. Or, uh, or if he has to take risk, then there are risky programs made uh, for this purpose. But you have to have a grant which is very solid uh, and very convincing and yet exciting. Uh, the beauty is that NIH favors the investigator initiated. It favors individualism. Okay? In Europe, you have to gather with, with people, people that sometimes are forced groups. They don't really naturally blend together. They might do it, but there's no real mechanism for having an investigator initiated grant. And America favors independence. You will not be dependent on your mentor. Actually, you will have to show your independence from your mentor. And I yet says, why should I pay this guy? I'm already paying his mentor. They're going to pay you for doing research if you show you are independently worth of being funded. And that something has to be gained almost immediately. You have to start carving out your own little field while you're still working for your mentor. And uh, you have to learn how to work the system, okay? Uh, not always, not everything is straightforward. You have to know the system very well and you have to integrate. Don't live here as an Italian if you want to stay here. Blend, speak English in your lab. Enjoy the American life. Really enjoy them. Enjoy what they like. Otherwise you'll be unhappy. If you think you can do this, then you're fit to stay. Going in Italy for your vacation, you're going to have great food, great friends, great places. But when you're here, you live as an American. And most of all, create your network. You have to start networking. The most important thing is to start networking. This is a huge country, and people have to know you. You know, the people in the study section must know your name. Uh, otherwise, is a, a mute application. So start networking. Really, networking is, is, is the basis <coughs> of being successful if you want to stay here. And, uh, and uh, the nice uh, uh, part is that there is a pathway. There is a set pathway, whereas in Europe there's no set pathway. I mean, the, uh, if you have to start, what do you do? You just hope. You know, that you get the concorso, that you can fit, uh, that you can work with a professor and do whatever he asks. But because there is not a pathway, one of the um, proposals from ISNAF actually to, to, to the Ministry of uh, Research was to create such a pathway. Okay? They have uh, this sort of uh, young investigator grant which is uh, delirious. Okay? But here you have a pathway for, for, uh, for independence. And so you start immediately applying for small uh, grants uh, from foundations, from the they are less competitive. But you, you start building your grantability. You are somebody upon which somebody else has already put money. Okay? So small, small money, small money makes big money. So you start doing this. And you'll have the lab. You'll be, people will be grateful for you. And then you start applying for some mentor grants. And there are mentor grants from the NIH for a number of foundations as well. And a mentor grant is something that you still have your mentor, but you are more and more in primarily involved in the research. And, and finally, there are other grants, the KOO and, and so on, that is called Pathway to Independence where part of the grant would be mentor and part of the grant would be your own, okay? And that's the door to the Mythica R01. So, but that's the career you have, to, you have to go through and you have to know this pathway. Otherwise, you're gonna fail. 
But what if you decide to go back, as I did? Well, be prepared. The system is not prepared for you. Uh, but the system really needs you. I mean, we, we need desperately people that have seen the other way of doing science, of doing the, the work of the university, people that have seen it, that believe it, and, and they will always believe this and try to bring it back to Italy, okay? But be prepared because the system is not ready. Um, all the programs that have been made uh, to uh, uh, made against the brain drain were never really well sought out. Uh, but still you can do it. it it's a matter of um, being persistent. When I went back the first time, okay, I didn't have a position, but I did have a lab. I was nobody, but I had fellows. <laughs> I was nobody, but I had more money than some of the full professors in the division, okay? And in the end, it worked out. So there's always a way. There is always a way you can do it by analyzing the problem, analyzing the landscape. What you need to do is to be persistent in the strategy, but very flexible in the tactic. And in Italy, in particular, your tactic must be absolutely flexible because you don't have pathways as here. Okay? It's all a matter of your ability to generate uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, after uh, four years at Yale, when I really worked very, very hard, okay? uh, we had to restart the transplant program, uh, and uh, the transplant program was uh, stopped uh, five years early and it was low, a, as the jungle had eaten even the ruins of the program. Nobody remembered anything, nobody knew anything anymore. So we started really from scratch again. And I remember the first year I spent 36 weekends in, uh, in the hospital because I was the only one who, who knew what to do. Okay? But then start, uh, slowly we, we, we started it and, and, and it took off. And, uh, and also, finally, I was able to get an R01 uh, before my uh, <coughs> start, uh, recruitment packet uh, <laughs> dried up. So now I'm an NIH investigator, and I'm very happy, and so on and so forth. As soon as I established myself there, then the University of Milano, Bicocca, said, well, you know, there's a program now where you can come back because the ministro, I don't remember his name, um, um, decided that the, the program uh, to directly call professor from the States will be funded. Okay, are they gonna fund it for, for, for every year? No, just this time. <laughs> <laughs> Musi was the minister. That's right. Yeah? We had problem with, with, with liver. Why? You transplanted. No, it's kidney. Well, kidney? Okay. okay, this has to be taken out. <laughs> okay, so, uh, is, is this going to be a program? No, just this time. <laughs> okay, fine, that's the way Italy is. So the, so the university applied. You don't apply for that, the university applied. And the University of Milano Bicocca got me. And, um, and um, okay, before this, what happened was that when I moved uh, to Yale, I, I felt really bad to leave all that money in Bergamo, okay? And leave what I started in Bergamo uh, without my attending because uh, the program was just starting. So the university, Yale University and the Bergamo Hospital made a, 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 like a memorandum of understanding in which uh, there was uh, the explanation of exchanges between that lab and, and, and the liver center. And I was able to remain a PI also in the lab in Bergamo. So this is uh, how I started to fly back to, to Italy once a month for a week. 
Så vores dagen af de her univers, det er jo ganske meget, der vores flying back to, to, my, to my lab in Bergamo. So. Before I was leaving for the States, the University of Milano Bicocca wanted me to join their faculty when I was still in Bergamo. That was not possible because uh, the uh, um, uh, chief of division, they were not affiliated with the, with the university and the hospital, vetoed. Okay? Probably they were not wrong, I mean, <laughs> considering what the university is, but uh, that, that program could not go through. But then they, they went back when I, when I was in the States using this. this This technology, right, to, to use the so-called rientro dei cervelli uh, in order to bring me back. So I said, okay, this is interesting. I always wanted to, you know, to apply in Italy what I learned. I think I learned a lot. Uh, you know, watching this great American university as a fellow and as a professor, there's a lot to, to learn. And uh, when I went to Milano Bicocca University, I discovered that they had nothing for me, okay? There was no GI division in the hospital. <laughs> there was not a chair. There was not a table. There was not a lab. <laughs> and there was no money. Absolutely no program, okay? So that's another important thing, right? So how, how do we Italian want to attract the best researcher if you don't change the system. The matter is not to attract back the Italians because they have their mom and aunt and uncles in Italy, but are we able to generate a system so that the best researcher would like to elect Italy as their place of residence? And the answer, unfortunately, is not because we can barely attract back <laughs> the Italians that wants to go back and see their mom, okay? So there was nothing there. And this is how I said, okay, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I was very uh, honest. I uh, asked the, the Yale University uh, and, and the dean uh, to be able to uh, give back my tenure position and, and, and be enrolled as an adjunct pro full professor with a promise that I can change my mind, okay? So I can still change my mind. <laughs> and, and so I said, okay, the only way this is working if we strike a deal. Hmm? Are you interested in having a full GI section or are you interested in having somebody who comes here and do the lessons? Uh, because I can do both. Okay, until you're ready, then we should probably work from distance and try to generate what is needed. So finally the agreement was, okay, we can do this. We, we generate a bilateral program, also because there's nothing. I mean, there was absolutely and literally nothing, nothing there. And this is the common experience that you read sometimes in the newspapers, right? But I, you know, I, I don't want to write the newspaper, so I, again, started to work on this program, a new scenario. The uh, time uh, contracted with the hospital in Bergamo was going to an end, so I, I was able to split some of the equipment, most remained there, but was not of their property, came with the university. I asked the faculty to have some laboratory space. They said yes, 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 tomorrow, yes, tomorrow. After one and a half year, I said, now I'm going to the rector. And uh, the rector was a great person. I said, listen, I need to have space. So he basically went one day with me <laughs> to the medical school and said, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> it was an empty space. I mean, there were empty spaces, but they were not giving them out. And then I started to apply for grants, uh, and, now, and now here we are, okay? Now I have a lab. The lab is funded by um, some private money, but mostly is uh, uh, money from the PRIN, the, the, the Italian uh, Ministry Grants, the Cariplo uh, Foundation, which is an important mechanism in, uh, in 
Lombardy, uh, coming from uh, competitive grants, from Teleton and other sources. And I have uh, uh, eight, ten people. And, and we have uh, set uh, uh, this collaboration so that you know, uh, the uh, students from the University of Bicocca, they come uh, uh, to Yale University during the summer. There's a summer program for them. Uh, usually they see the light and they are changed forever and some of them want to to come back for the thesis so there's a there's another program which is called the extra program in which some money comes from the Cariplo foundation and the money I, I provide and they come for the thesis and they spend like three three months six months and then some of them wants to stay on and do the PhD so they can come and do the PhD some of the postdoc and so far, around 25 people benefit from, from this exchange. And we work uh, together through IT, right? Is, uh, she's sitting over there, but we would have a screen with the other part of the lab on the other side with the Atlantic. And every Wednesday, we have this lab meeting. And uh, it's actually working uh, in, a, in a very interesting way. So that's the way you deal with double appointments. There's no codified pathway, it just happens. I brought this to the attention of the Italian Embassy um, and also of Ministro Profumo once. Uh, and he was very interested in the idea, but still uh, I think that we should work in, in trying to set some codified pathway. Because I think it's something that both institutions can benefit uh, tremendously for, from having people able to work in the two system. Now working in a two system is, is a great privilege, it's a great benefit because you can see the good of both parts. And particularly <clears throat> in healthcare, okay, one of my major regions to consider to, to work again in, uh, in Italy is because I, uh, I really think we are doing a better job in treating our patients as a population. Okay, I think Italian healthcare is, a, is very good, it's very fair, it's accessible, and, and it's cheap, and the overall results are similar, if not better. Okay? Now, at the University of Bicocca, uh, we have a GI division, and uh, the chief of the GI division, and we have programs, and, and uh, so now there's also a hospital who's backing these activities. But, <clears throat> Uh, it, for example, from the healthcare system, there's a lot to learn. Okay, we in the states are good in things that we in Italy are not good at, and vice versa. So, if you want to have the best of the best, the best RAM program, uh, the coolest the tools, you have to come here. But if you really want to practice sustainable, <laughs> high quality health care for a mass of people, you have to learn from Italy. 5.5% of uh, uh, the gross product of Lombardy is spent in health care. And we can do it, and we get people from everywhere in Italy, and we can still take great care of these patients. So I think in the future that there will be uh, more interaction of this sort, in which we learn from each other. So that's my story so far. And uh, again, there is no uh, codified uh, mechanism, but you have to be very flexible in your tactic to reach your strategy. My strategy was to leave a, a rich uh, scientific and professional life and to be able to do something with my country anyway and that's how it is now so finally uh, a couple of words for for the young people that are considering a, a, a career in, uh, in research so be ambitious all right be ambitious and uh, there's a say that hey, uh, shoot for the moon, even if you miss it, you, you'll end up among the stars. <laughs> okay? and, and, and the best definition of um, being ambitious in a good way 
I, I read it from, from uh, a talk of, of uh, John Kennedy, who, who said, happiness is the full use of your talents along lines of excellence. So fight to be able to have this privilege, and if you believe it, it will happen. And, but don't be isolated, okay? Do as these guys are doing. Communicate, be part of your environment, change the environment, be part of the advocacy. Don't pretend that there is an environment that is made for you if you don't work on it, as if it was one of your grants. So, if you are a scientist, you have to convince the other people, the lay people, that science is a great thing, that we cannot live without science. So be part of the society, not outside of the society, and be part of this and communicate. Communicate why you're happy to be a scientist. Communicate why people should pay you. Communicate why people should grant you the privilege of being paid to follow your curiosity. There's no other work like this. There's no other job like this in the world, okay? You're paid for your hobby. That never happens, okay? But if you are a scientist, you can be paid for your hobby. But the people want to know why. Why should they do this? Who are you bringing to the society? We are bringing a lot to the society, but we don't take the time to communicate this. And I think this is why uh, uh, Italian universities are in such a bad shape, because there's nobody speaking for them. Nobody has really made the job of be part of a, a bigger discussion. Right? And, and this is done through communication, advocacy, and uh, being generous for yourself. Uh, and that's also why you should join ISNAF, because ISNAF is what this is all ISNAF is about. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions <laughs> from the young. <laughs> So, Professor Guerra, if you want to do a, a great career in science... Uh, <laughs> I reset my clock, yes. <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you, Professor Strazabosco. It, it was a, a very enlightening talk, I thought. And um, one question that came to my mind is, uh, is this one. Sometimes very young investigators, they contact me through the ISNAP website. They say, you know, I read about you on the ISNAP website and I have a, um, a question and sometimes I'm puzzled about the answer I should give and the question is I would like to start a PhD program uh, but I don't know if I should start it in Italy and then try and come to the US as an exchange a visiting scientist or I should just try and uh, enter a PhD program in the US and so I know that there, pro there are pros and cons in doing these things, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. It's arguable, so I would like to know your opinion about it. There are two very different programs, although they award the same title, no? So, um, are these uh, biologists, uh, physicians, uh, <coughs> usually engineers? Well, so far, like chemists and uh, biologists. Well, I can only speak for my discipline, okay? Yeah. I don't know exactly. I, I think that if you are a physician, uh, even maybe a biologist, um, you uh, can do your PhD in Italy mm -hmm. and, and really try to, to work and to force the system to let you outside more than one year. That's often possible. Um, if you are going to do a PhD in the U.S., first of all, uh, you have to uh, you have to start early to do this. You know, there are programs that, for example, at Yale we we have the combined MD PhD program. It's not something you can enter uh, independently. Uh, so I think that. For, for biosciences, you may still do this. But for example, if you are in uh, some sort of humanities, other problems, I think probably it's more interesting to, to do it here. So again, it depends very much by your discipline and your field. Thank you. Okay, another question.
interested. It's a remarkable story <laughs> you gave us. And I think it's very inspirational. I'm not sure if I were a young uh, investigator or uh, just beginning my career in science, I would be uh, delighted to hear what you just said because it kind of stimulates your thinking and uh, it opens a uh, number of possibilities. But if you compare the, the current PhD system in Italy to the PhD system in the US, mm -hmm. uh, do you see differences and which kind of differences do you think uh, are apparent you know, when you make this comparison? Now, my experience with the few Italian postdocs I've had in my lab is that they are not really prepared by the Italian PhD system to become independent investigators. I don't know if my personal experience or it's a general feeling. Well, that's a general, uh, I would say, that's a general flow of uh, the Italian uh, university. We don't completely prepare the people for the job. We half prepare them and then give them a title, okay? But then you can catch up because if you go in a good lab, you'll be fast learning. And at that point, have a expandable title and be ready. But that's true along all lines. I mean, we, at the medical school, we don't prepare doctors. We prepare pre-specialty kids. <laughs> and then during the specialty, after five years of specialty paid by the state, these guys are now ready to hit the ground. You know, gastroenterology in Italy is five years. At year we can prepare a full-size gastroenterologist in two years after their fellowship after their residency. So it would be total of uh, four, but uh, they would be well-trained internists during the, the, during the residency, and then uh, full developed gastroenterologists. So, you know, there's a lot to, to work uh, on the Italian system, and um, the problem I see also now is that people uh, they think that they can just fix the problem by increasing regulations. But it's all increasing regulation by reducing the access. Nobody measures anything. Nobody measures really what the outcome of what you're doing is. Okay? And that's the biggest difference here. You know, you measure the output. You measure... Uh, and they are, and you are accountable, okay? You can lose your training program. Now, uh, to spare money, they are reducing the number of specialty school. Hmm? So if you want to do GI in, uh, in Italy, you have to go to the Milano Statale. But why? Why? I wanna, I wanna teach differently. I want to have my own school, not because I don't trust them, but because I want to do something a certain way with my friends here. And I'm, I bet that I can uh, uh, generate a GI specialist in half of the time. Why don't you let me challenge this? Why to say no? Now this year we are making 500 less special to people actually to spare money. Spare what? <laughs> You're not spending money. You're spending money on different things. And, and, and this, this concept that they don't understand that by uh, reducing the biodiversity, even in the professional uh, arena, they're actually making things worse. On the other hand, you should let people compete, all right? You should let people compete. Don't uh, reduce the access. Monitor the outcome. And this is what we are completely unable to make them understand. This, we tried this with ISNA. It's just that it's congenital in the Italian system. They don't want to judge. And why? Because they don't want to be judged. What do you think, Professor Guerra? I'm entirely agree, but I have a question, please. Yeah. You read a book to us. You are wife and you are and professional experience, but we're missing the end. 
what next? I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 that's the part I, want, I didn't want to touch. But it's, it's, uh, we see, we're still last in between. You know, you have this still this dichotomy. What do you think would be the next step? You cannot continue all your that's life. A, that's a hard question. Hmm? You cannot continue all your life just going. You know, as you say, you're flexible. So, right. what will be your next degree of flexibility? Um, I have a project I won't tell. <laughs> okay, if this project doesn't work, uh, I finally have to make a decision. But probably, you know, at this point of my career, it would be my family and my kids who decide. I have done what I wanted to do. Okay, I, I still can do much more. But, and, and there's one thing I want to do <laughs> that still remain unspoken. But if that doesn't work, I think at this point I can let the other stakeholders decide. And this is what I'm going to do. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, one, um, uh, one question, like your comment on the fact that, uh, as uh, you said, some students come here, spend uh, three months or six months, one year they go back. Some other people that invest here a uh, longer time, like two years, five years, and then go, or even 10 years, and then decide to go back. And as you say, the system is not prepared to uh, have these people coming back and to receive the light they could, could bring back. So do you think there could be a role uh, for um, uh, a networking system uh, putting together all the people who, uh, and, uh, that have this experience in North America or somewhere else and how to start it if ISNAF could have potential role in that? You, you mean back in Italy? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so there are two answers to, to, to your comment. Uh, uh, number one, uh, yes, I, I, I think that ISNAP should, uh, hopefully, you know, the governing board uh, will sooner or later decide.